thank you very much and and thank you everyone for coming it's uh, it's great to be able to talk about uh, the remedies project um so i'm going to share quite a bit with you this evening um so without further ado we'll get on with the presentation so as i say i'm going to be talking um about BGRAT um, and the EU Life Recreation Remedies Project, also about the relationship of blue carbon to seagrass as well. Um, so yeah, as you might have already heard, my name is Kate, Kate Witten, and, and I'm the volunteer and community engagement manager for the South and Southeast England. So it's a little bit of a, of a long-winded title, but essentially I do a lot of community engagement on this particular project and beyond as well. Um, so yes, we'll get straight into it. Hopefully everyone can see the slides okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about our current work in marine protected areas um, containing the seagrass in southern England. Um, and we're really proud to be part of the large EU funded collaborative project called the Life Recreation Remedies Project. And this is to restore damaged seagrass meadow uh, in the south of England. So this work is really exciting. A lot's going on right now. Um, first of all, I'm going to kind of set the scene a little bit um, so we can look at why these seabed habitats are such a focus of conservation work at the moment. So what is seagrass? What does it do? Uh, why is everyone talking about blue carbon uh, at the moment as well? And at the end, hopefully be able to have time to tell you um, and share with you what you can do to get involved as well. So just a quick question. Um, again, hopefully some people saw the little video that I was playing when you joined. Um, if you can just pop in the chat. Um, what are the first words that pop into your head um, when I mention seagrass? Do you know about it? Do you not know about it? Um, again, please just pop some stuff in the chat. That'd be really useful to compare when we come to the end of the, of the presentation as well. So um, up until recently, um, seagrass um, has not really been that well known, um, but it's also come to the forefront in the last few years, for sure, as important marine habitat. Uh, and that's for counteracting the climate and the biodiversity crisis. So again, great to get a snapshot of what people think about this, because 2021 is the first year um, of the UN decade of, of ecosystem restoration. So it is a perfect time for us to be talking about this very special underwater system um, that we're trying to restore and protect. So um, I'll explain all the things it can provide to all of us as well, because it's, it's really, really important. So what in the ocean is seagrass? Um, so seagrasses, they're not actually grasses at all. They're flowering plants that grow in the marine environment. Um, they're around 70-ish or so species, um, and they're found on all continents except the Antarctic. Um, but there are two main species of seagrass here in England that we're focusing on with the, with the Life Recreation Project, and that's Zostra marina and Zostra naltio. And they, they might also be called eelgrass as well. You might hear them, hear them referred to as eelgrass, but as I say, they're not actually grasses. Um, Zostra marina is mainly a subtitle species, and Zostra naltii, or dwarf eelgrass as it's called, is primarily intertidal. Um, and both these seagrass species grow in shallow, sheltered areas down to about 10 metres deep, but they love clear water, and that's really what they need. And they, they grow in substrates such as sand, such as mud, uh, and also in fine, uh, fine gravel as well. So not to be confused, so seagrass or eelgrass, not to be confused with um, these other two species. So these are species of tassleweed. So they're the rupia species. Um, and again, they might sometimes be called widgeon grass. So again, you know, we, we really sort of need to clarify what we're talking about when we're talking about, about seagrass or the zostra species. So again, just to kind of go through um, the differences between seagrass uh, and seaweeds or algae. Um, seaweeds have a hold fast that doesn't actually penetrate the seabed. Um, and seaweeds also use a passive system of diffusion as well for transporting nutrients that they take from the seawater uh, around and into their cells. Whereas in contrast to that, seagrass does have true roots, um, penetrates the, the seabed. It's got rhizomes that link the individual plants together as well. And basically these form a connected network that covers the seabed. Um, so seagrass actively takes up nutrients as well, and they're transported around the plant via a, a vascular system that the seaweeds lack. And the nutrients are stored in the rhizomes as well. So they form this dense mat between the leaves and the roots. And that's a, a really important feature when you, you're sort of looking at seagrass and how to restore it and, and look at seagrass biology as well. 
So as a plant, um, seagrasses do produce flowers and seeds and they, they re reproduce sexually as well. So in this top picture, you can see the, the seeds um, just on this hand here. Let me move that out of the way. Um, and they look like sort of tiny little tic tacs within the within the actual leaf itself. But also amazingly, they can re reproduce asexually as well. So they develop clones on their rhizomes. So again, they need clarity of water in order to grow and to flourish. So if there's too many suspended particulates in the water, so like silt or it could be pollutants, then this will stunt the seagrass. Um, it won't be able to photosynthesize properly. Um, so therefore it won't grow properly. And also many tiny herbivores which do live on the seagrass, they will graze the algae and the detritus and help it clean and able to function as well. So there's a few things going on there. So why is seagrass so important? Why do we need to protect it? So as you can see here, um, actually quite a few reasons why we need to do that. Um, it provides shelter, habitat and food for so many marine organisms. Um, and these particular seagrass meadows provide a nursery area for lots of juvenile adults, juvenile an animals, sorry. And that's particularly true for fish as well. Seagrass, there, it's a keystone species. Um, it creates a rich biodiversity of life compared with a sandy, bare sandy seabed. So up to 40 times more animals will live in a seagrass meadow than on a, a bare sort of area. Seagrass is brilliant at absorbing wave action and reduces seabed and shore erosion. It binds the sediment together. Uh, it also um, removes nutrients from runoff as well and pollutants from the water, so it locks it away in its, in its tissues, in its cells. As we've seen, it takes in carbon dioxide, it photosynthesizes, so it does two great jobs, takes in CO2 and also gives out oxygen. Um, and it can do that for, for quite a long time. But unfortunately, um, all these great things that it does, it's actually estimated that looking at some historical records for the UK, that seagrass has declined massively uh, by about 70% in UK waters since the 1930s. So it's struggling. It really is struggling. So we do need to give it a bit of a hand. And this particular slide, I, I really love it just because it shows uh, and illustrates how important seagrass is for, for eggs and as a nursery area as well. So we've got some cuttlefish eggs on the left. We've got some netted dog whelk eggs in the middle. And then we've got um, some juvenile seahorses there as well, which, which really can't survive without seagrass. Seagrass is kind of integral for them. And this was, the, all these photos were, were sort of put, um, were sort of photographs, sorry, in Southern England seagrass beds as well, which is fantastic. So which species do not live in seagrass, UK seagrass meadows? Which of these ones? Well, it's kind of a trick question because they all do, apart from, um, this photo here of the green turtle. Um, so it does graze on seagrass beds, but not within the UK. It's in tropical areas. But, but all these other species and many more do use the seagrass beds um, for all sorts of reasons. So we've got some great species on here. We've got um, a stalk jellyfish in the middle here, which is actually quite rare, quite very, very small and very hard to find as well. Mussels, they certainly use seagrass beds as well. Um, so they don't necessarily end up on rocky shores all the time. We've got a juvenile black bream here as well. So very important, as we, as I've said before, as a nursery area for lots of species of fish. Um, and again, a huge number, a huge number and a huge other variety of, of animals that live within them. So they're really biodiverse. So seagrass, yes, it is an ocean superhero. Um, it's got super properties that make it really vital, not just for creatures in the ocean, but also for the health of the planet, which I'm going to talk about. And obviously everybody that lives on the planet, obviously that's us. So it provides uh, what we call ecosystem services as well. So uh, these are functions which are not only essential for the ocean, but for humans and, and the whole planet. So um, these are the many and varied benefits to humans. Um, if you kind of have a little look online, um, the main five ecosystem services are pollination, decomposition, water purification, and ones that are particularly pertinent to this talk um, are erosion and flood control, plus carbon sto storage and climate regulation as well. So again, I'm going to expand on, on this as, as we go along in the, in the talk. So... Seagrass beds, they're amongst the most productive ecosystems in the world. Um, here we're going to talk about net primary production or what we call NPP. And this gives an index to compare how fast plants in different habitats turn carbon dioxide into carbon compounds within their tissues. So 
Seagrass beds have an average MPP rate of between 300 to 1500 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. Now that's depending on the species. So the MPP average that we've just mentioned here is from temperate and subtropical seagrass species. So they tend to um, do a lot of this um, uh, NPP rate, uh, it's a higher NPP rate in these in these subtropical areas. But it does compare compare really well with seaweed. So seaweed comes in at around about 375 uh, grams of carbon per meter squared per year on average. Um, and we also have terrestrial forests that come in around about 400 grams. So yeah, they do compare incredibly well. They're a really important habitat. Um, and it's often quoted that every second breath that we take comes from the ocean. So that will be from phytoplankton, from seaweed and from seagrass. So if you're lucky enough to go snorkeling over seagrass beds uh, when it's lovely and clear, then you can kind of see the oxygen bubbling up from there as well. So this is pretty much why we tend to call seagrass the lungs of the ocean, because it's they're, they're super, super useful and super, super handy for us. So moving on to the, the sort of the current buzzword, I would say, which is uh, is blue carbon. Um, this is the carbon stored in coastal and marine ecosystems. So these ecosystems sequester and store large quantities of blue carbon in both the plants and also the sediment below. Um, so, for example, over about 95 percent of the carbon in seagrass meadows is actually stored in the soil. So the roots and the rhizomes kind of binding that all together. So. Seagrass uh, and other photosynthesizers in the ocean take inorganic carbon from the water. If they can lock it up in their tissues for a long time, they're basically called blue carbon sinks. So obviously helping to soak up all those CO2 uh, emissions. And blue carbon can be described as both organic and inorganic. And these forms of carbon storage can be affected by sea temperature changes and also, also ocean acidification changes as well. So we've got a 2006 figure here, which shows the global distribution of seagrass in relation to mean ocean temperature. And you can see seagrass has a wide and varied distribution. It's found in about 159 countries, uh, but of the 70 species, unfortunately, 10 of these are classed as, risk, as at risk of extinction uh, and three are actually classed as endangered as well. So we're losing, we've lost a lot of seagrass in the UK, but we're also losing it uh, worldwide as well. Um, the ocean is for sure the largest long term carbon sink on Earth. Um, it drives the carbon cycle as well. Um, and basically an estimated 93% of the Earth's carbon dioxide is stored and cycled through the ocean and stored in lots of different things. So soft tissues, hard coral, skeletons, shells of marine plants and in animals as well. So even though only a tiny bit of all the carbon on the Earth will actually end up on the sea floor, um, it can remain buried for thousands, if not millions of years, if it's undisturbed. And there is more is there is more than two times as much carbon locked in marine sediments as there is in terrestrial. Having said that, in deep ocean carbon sinks, um, the ones that are in protected areas, it's less than two percent. So, again, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this carbon could be vulnerable to disturbance. So where does it all come from? Um, how does carbon get captured? So two sources of carbon which come into blue carbon habitats um, and they're autochthonous. So autochthonous carbon, which is formed or fixed in its present position, um, basically like how leaves fix carbon during photosyn photosynthesis and allochthonous as well. So that's carbon which comes from, from elsewhere. So that's, for example, if seaweed contains carbon, it's just transported to the deep sea and then it becomes buried. So we've mentioned there are two sources of carbon. There are also two types of carbon as well, so inorganic and organic. Um, we've also got a carbon accretion, which is important when talking about climate mitigation, and carbon sequestration, which is basically long-term carbon storage. So seagrass plays a role with all of these factors. So within a carbon sink, so carbon's drawn down, within carbon source, where carbon is released, and within a carbon store, so basically carbon is stored in that habitat. So in 2020, um, we had a report, which is this one. So that's out of the blue. And that was released by the United Nations Environment Programme and Partners. And this showed how seagrass ecosystems can play a huge role in combating the climate crisis and, and of the economic value that they can deliver as well. Covering only around 0.1% of the total ocean floor, um, undisturbed seagrass meadows are absolutely highly efficient blue carbon sinks. 
but again, they're among the least protected of coastal habitats. So only about a quarter of the recorded seagrass meadows worldwide fall within protected areas. So restoring seagrass and other natural solutions are beginning to be recognised as, as, again, as hugely important tools. Um, and MCS have just released a report in collaboration with Rewilding Britain. Um, and this outlines the importance of the ocean and of restoring the habitats in it. And that's helping the UK to reach net zero by 2050. So that's well worth uh, checking out from our website as well if you're interested in, in a bit of further reading. So seagrass not, doesn't only affect climate, but climate change also affects seagrass as well. So it's kind of like in this, in this circle, in this cyclical effect. Um, and the raised ocean temperatures that we're seeing could have cumulative effects in the shallow estuaries, bays and lagoons where the seagrass actually lives. Um, some studies are actually predicting it could compound conditions that have driven the 70% UK seagrass loss over the past decades. And, and it can a, basically a cascade of effects can prove difficult for seagrass to withstand conditions like increased evaporation rates and salt content, especially in these shallow areas. Also nutrient enrichment, so that's leading to more microbial activity and algal blooms and cloudy water and the release of toxic chemicals. Decreased oxygen, uh, decreased dissolved oxygen impacts all life in the meadows. But equally, some species of seagrass in some places could do well from warmer seas, but that's only if everything else actually stays in, in balance. So it's really complex to predict as there are also other um, factors at work like ocean acidification, which could destroy grazers of seagrass. So sea level rise, we know is going to cause a problem. Um, along with frequent severe storms, flooding due to climate change, likely, uh, very likely to lead to increased coastal erosion and light extinction in current seagrass beds. Um, as waves and turbulence increase, as shallow areas deepen as well, that will cause a destruction of the seagrass. So if it goes as far as the roots, it will stop regeneration completely. And it's predicted that in the Great Barrier Reef, for example, that 20% of seagrass will be lost with a, with a one metre sea level rise. So we, we really are at risk of losing you know, global beds. Um, and of course, the majority of seagrass beds globally, they, they are unlikely to overcome all of these predicted impacts if all of these impacts um, occur together as well. So threats to seagrass globally, we've covered a few. Um, there's gonna be some more um, sort of hands-on ones that I'm just going to go through here. Um, so we've got we've got quite a lot. Seagrass has been kind of um, besieged on all sides. Um, so we've got habitat disturbance. So that could be through trampling. It could be through launching craft or bait digging or vehicles or people dragging things over the seagrass. We've also got threats from ship anchors and propellers. So they are physically damaging. And shipping uh, could also pollute the, oil, the ocean with oil, with diesel, with lots of other contaminants as well. There's also um, a wasting disease, um, and this is caused by some parasites and um, protists. And this has caused um, large dieback of large areas of seagrass in the UK. And this pretty much occurred in the 1930s. Um, if that happens, then fungus and slime mold pathogens, they colonise seagrass we can see grass and that still appears today. So that appears in the Isles of Cillian and the Solent seagrass beds. And then we've also got other things such as uh, nutrient enrichment, herbicides, fertilizers, um, lots of runoff from land-based agriculture and industry. So that'll all increase seagrass's vulnerability to pathogens and to other stresses as well. So it's like a cumulative effect. Um, and we also have invasive and introduced species. So English cord grass, the seaweed, which is the Japanese wireweed, that can invade meadows and outcompete native seagrass as well. So lots and lots of things. Um, we've got coastal and marine development there. We've got fishing and aquaculture, which again could lead to nutrient overload. Um, and again, lack of awareness. So one of the main reasons um, for sort of being involved with the project from engagement side of things is to talk to people about, about what is going on and what, what we can all do as well. So um, the lack of awareness, even those from that maybe use the marine environment regularly. So, you know, seagrass can absolutely have a have a really tough time of things. So I'm just going to show you a little video now uh, of, of a seagrass bed um, and what happens when um, it's disturbed or it's um, 
it's affected by by anchor chains and moorings uh, and anchor chains as well and um, so i'll just start this video hopefully this works oh, there we go so there's no sound on this but as you can see we've got um a lovely volunteer chris cooling has been using an rov deployed on the seabed to, to assess the damage um, of these impacts but also how we can we could help recover seagrass help seagrass recover and um, so we've got a concrete block and chain there so that's a traditional sort of mooring um, you can see there's a little bit of, of algae a little bit seaweed on the block itself but not a huge amount and um, the chain you can see on the seabed it then rises back up to the top it'll be, be held in place with a buoy but you can see where the chain lies on the seabed um, it's very very bare it's very very sandy the, there's not a lot of life there at all there might be the odd bit of algae here and there that's been sort of blown by the by the currents and by the tide across the sandy area but again nothing's really rooting nothing's there and that's all down to the chain scour the radius of the chain scour and then you come across this um so an amazing bit of seagrass bed which is just outside the reach of the chain um and it's looking absolutely lovely that is a lovely example of a, of a healthy seagrass bed um and you can see going over it that it's it's in really good condition compared with that sandy seabed there's a real mark there's a real delineation between the scour and, and the seagrass there so again what what can we do about this you know this is there are lots of traditional moorings out there um not so many um advanced mooring suit advanced mooring systems so again what can we do one solution is to lift it all up so lift up that chain if we're still using a traditional mooring block um you can replace the block with a helical anchor um so that can actually be screwed into the sediment um and that impacts a lot less of the seabed but it can still withstand the forces pulling on the anchor but allowing also allowing the chain to move freely about so this is called a sterling mooring that we see here and there are various other designs um, that use other ways of reducing the damage of a chain and block. Um, you can use something like an elasticated tether. Um, and these are quite common in other countries as well. So a lot of them are being used. Uh, we, we did call them eco moorings, um, but we now use the term advanced mooring systems. So it's basically AMS. So if you hear me mention AMS, it's advanced mooring systems. So this will, if we use advanced mooring systems, then as I say, we'll reduce the impact on the seabed. Um, anchors, if you're just anchoring in, in a seagrass bed area, then they can they can drag the seagrass roots and rhizomes out and it will cause a lot of the seagrass to die off as well. Um, and any flowering seagrass and seeds will also be removed and, and recolonisation of that particular area will be really difficult. So you can have lots of skilled people um, navigating through the seagrass bed. So it does depend on the skill of the crew as well. Um, but again, if people aren't so sure about where seagrass is and not so sure of a seagrass bed, they could damage it without realising. Um, but there are some absolutely brilliant guides, um, green guides to anchoring available uh, on the Royal Yachting Association website. So the green blue guides um, and they, the RYA also offers lots of training as well, which is fantastic. So that's really good. So once the pressure is taken off, um, as you can see here, there's there's a, a, an advanced mooring system going in here. Um, it should reduce the stresses on our seagrass. It should help um, to, to repair our seagrass where there's a healthy seagrass bed to reseed from as well. If not, then there, we are uh, employing some active techniques that can be used to replant and restore the seagrass beds as well. So this is where I kind of come on to the, the remedies project after giving you all that background. You know, what have we been doing um, to, re, re, to protect and restore the seagrass habitat? So, we're partners and um, the partners are down the screen on the bottom of the screen below. So there's MCS as ourselves, there's Natural England, we've got the Royal Yachting Association, Ocean Conservation Trust, Plymouth City Council and the Tamar Estuaries Consultative Forum as well. So we're funded for four years as part of this project as well. And, and unfortunately, it's not, not got a hugely um, catchy title, I'm afraid. So we just tend to, to sort of call it the Remedies Project. So this four year project, it aims to improve the condition of the five marine protected area sites, which I'll show you a map of in just a second. Um, and again, as you've seen, we're installing advanced mooring systems where we can and, and monitoring these. Um, but crucially, we need to get you know, local communities and boaters on board to understand the need for them as well, to, to trust the safety of them. There's lots of great data behind them. 
and to use best practice when when they are in use as well. So we're trying out voluntary no anchor zones around the marine protected areas. We're getting support from, from lots and lots of people. And obviously, we need to keep going with that as well. So over the course of the project, we are aiming to talk to about 750,000 people. So it's a lot of people um, through all the partners. Um, and obviously, this is talking about the importance of seagrass, the restoring of the seagrass beds and um, planting out of seagrass seeds and seedlings. But it's not just limited to that. It's also talking about myrrh, which is a calcified seaweed that, that grows incredibly slowly as well. Um, and also talking a heck of a lot about muddy bottoms as well. So, uh, yeah, it's very varied and, and sort of interesting work as well. So, yeah, we, we do need a lot of help with this. And here's the map I was just talking about. So these are the five NPAs that we're working in. So they're SACs, so Special Areas of Conservation, containing the seagrass beds. Uh, and in the Fallon Halford, uh, Merle is also a significant feature as well. Um, and these sites, they, they weren't just chosen because they're in the south of England. Um, but because Natural England, who are the government nature conservation organisation, assessed them as being in unfavourable status. So this means that active conservation measures are being needed to, um, to and need to be undertaken, basically, in order to halt and reverse these significant declines in these areas. And that's been measured in the quality of the habitats within. So this project is already having knock on effects to other seagrass sites around the UK, which is amazing, amazing work. Um, but we definitely have to give a special mention and credit Project Seagrass in Wales um, because a lot of what they're doing is based on the work, a lot of what we're doing, sorry, is based on the work that they've pioneered um, and that's being led by Cardiff University. So absolutely, we're, we're kind of learning from each other and sharing best practice as well. So in this particular slide, um, we can kind of see um, the stages of seagrass habitat restoration. So uh, in some of the, the highly damaged meadows where natural regeneration is unlikely because the seagrass is too patchy, uh, we're doing active restoration of the seagrass bed. And that's been done under license through harvesting, uh, growing, planting out of seedlings and also of the seeds as well. And the Ocean Conservation Trust and Natural England are leading the seagrass bed restoration work in Plymouth Sound and the Solent. So there's been lots of articles in the media. In fact, very, very recently, there's been lots more seagrass bagging being done as well down, down in the southwest. Um, and it's really one of the biggest and most ambitious restorations ever attempted in the UK marine environment. So very exciting work, but also a bit nerve wracking as well, whilst we're, we're obviously monitoring and waiting and, and hoping that it's going to be uh, very, as successful as possible. So with the actual restoration work, um, the seeds are being taken and, and grown and sown in, in small sort of little hessian bags of soil. They're kept in regulated tanks within Plymouth Aquarium for a few months, and they can then be planted out into the damaged seagrass area, protected areas where they can help restore the beds back um, to healthy, healthy density. So some lovely uh, recent project highlights that I'd love to share with you. So starting over in the southwest in Plymouth Sound, um, in April and May, um, the Ocean Conservation Trust uh, had volunteers, um, which included our MCS Sea Champion volunteers, um, and we were bagging up 16,000 hessian bags with, with seagrass seeds. Um, and these were then launched from a barge, so out on the water, on the barge, down a four metre tube to the seabed in Plymouth Sound. These are then going to germinate root out and then start establishing a seagrass bed. Uh, and the aim is to re-establish four hectares of, of seagrass meadow. So a lot of computer modelling and assessments were made to ensure they were sited correctly. Uh, according to some of our MCSC search divers and, and other divers as well, um, some sea bags have now germinated. So that's fantastic news as well. So Plymouth Sand are kind of leading the way. Um, the Solent um, is coming is, is coming up next. The so restoration in the Solent is going to start in spring of 2022, so next year. Um, and that's going to be another, hopefully another four hectares, um, which is going to be fantastic news. So we definitely need volunteers for that. Um, and Natural England staff uh, in the Essex estuaries are collecting data uh, for disturbance surveys um, to have a look and see what the next stage is going to be in that particular area as well. So in Plymouth Sound, there's been a, a VNAS, basically a voluntary no anchor zone put in place. Um, and that's at Jenny Cliff, where the seedlings and the seed bags are located. 
Um, and we did a lot of a lot of sort of awareness raising. We talked to a lot of yacht clubs and um, sports clubs, harbours in the area. Um, and we wanted to explain why this was going on, what it was there for, and, and try and request that nobody anchor there. Um, and so marker boys for the area used our advanced mooring system technology and six helical screws deployed into the seabed as well. So um, we've known... Uh, noticed at the sail gp event that happened recently this year that not not one recreational vessel was seen to be anchoring in the voluntary no anchor zone which was absolutely fantastic so people taking it on board which is absolutely brilliant and, and sort of getting on board with us so with regards to the ams the advanced mooring systems installation and monitoring um, back in August, um, MCS and OCT, so the Ocean Conservation Trust, put in 10 new advanced mooring systems at Core Sands, and that makes the NCS contribution um, to be 15 moorings at this, at this site now, so it's increasing, which is brilliant. Um, and Natural England have further moorings to put in as well, so there will be AMS used to hold in place a swim area marking zone in the bay as well. We've also had students from Plymouth University. They've been monitoring the seagrass uh, around these areas compared to traditional moorings. Um, and they found that most AMS have better seagrass cover than traditional moorings, which is brilliant. Um, but not 100% of the time. So sighting is absolutely crucial to get, it's got to be optimum to, to in order the, the seagrass to, to regenerate. Um, the Falmouth Harbour Commissioners, they've actually installed two AMS like these at the top, top photo uh, off Flushing Beach. Um, and again, you've seen the video from our volunteer yachtsman, Chris Cooling, um, deploying the ROV to assess the seagrass there. Um, and it's showing that the location of a new no anchoring or mooring line at Flushing is the right place in protecting the most dense seagrass bed. So again, lots of lots of work being put in to ensure they're going in the right place. Um, more students and academics, again, from University of Exeter has shown that this bed hosts the most rich carbon rich sediments as well. So we've got a picture of Ellie at the bottom there looking at cores from the seabed. So again, doing a lot more research. Um, and it's really, well, a really big thank you, really big sort of hats off to the Falmouth Harbour Commissioners because they are the people in charge of flushing and they've been really brave um, and should be really congratulated at taking 11 traditional visitor boat moorings out there so AMS have gone in and the traditional boat moorings have come out so that will help seagrass um, enormously. Um, with regards to Solent we've got one AMS going in in cows on the Isle of Wight and more are planned uh, when the optimum sighting is, is going to be ascertained so when we know we're putting them in in, in the right areas. So on this particular slide so clockwise We've got a sea search volunteer dive and snorkel surveyors. They've been hard at work monitoring and mapping seagrass all summer. That's um, post-COVID. Um, we've got uh, students and volunteers working on various seagrass projects, including analysing a lot of the ROV underwater footage as well. And we're trying to work together collaboratively with lots of organisations um, to produce a correct and up-to-date map of where seagrass is, um, which weirdly and crazily doesn't actually exist at the moment there's a lot of information in lots of different places but not one definitive place you can go to find out where seagrass is it's, it's kind of the information's in lots of different places we've been out to schools as well which has been fantastic and um, we've done that virtually and in person um, and we've done lots of or as many events as we possibly have been able to um, considering the covid pandemic but we've connected lots of children, thousands of children um, with seagrass and also their families as well. And we've had a massive communication effort targeted, re targeted at recreational boaters too. So we're researching behaviour change. How can we drive this forward? How can we sort of, you know, instill this confidence um, in, in protecting our seagrass beds for the future? You know, what does and doesn't work? We're doing a huge amount more than that as well. But as I say, I, I could I could go on a, a lot. There is a lot of information online and I'll kind of direct everybody to that as well. Um, but here's just a nice little project summary that the Ocean Conservation Trust put together. Um, so again, just to recap, you know, over four years, five special areas of conservation, we're going to re restore and protect seabed habitats, mainly seagrass, but also in real. So um, yes, I apologise. I've, I've kind of taken about... 15, 20 minutes to explain something that, that could be said in 30 seconds, but at least it's kind of giving you a really nice overview um, of what's been going on. So you can see a project presentation on the Seagrass Remedies Project 
um, on YouTube as well. So the link's down the bottom of the screen there. So we've been doing a lot. We've been having a lot of help with this as well, which has been amazing. Um, but, you know, what can what can you do? What can everybody, anybody do to help as well? So again, a few things um, that I'm just going to mention. So every, everybody can do something to help um, ocean, to help the ocean, whether you live by the sea or not. So um, seagrass and other blue carbon habitats are so linked with climate change and ocean warming. We know this. Um, here's kind of like top 10 uh, the top 10 things that you can do to help seagrass, basically the top 10 things you can do to help the climate. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of these before. Uh, these are the kind of tips that I'm sure most of you know already. So I'm not going to teach you how to suck eggs, but a couple of seagrass special ones um, would be avoiding fast fashion. So that's um, number nine. So go slow, go slow fashion, um, because fast, fa fast fashion essentially... Um, Cheap, you know, we've got cheap clothes, they pollute the rivers with dye, our oceans with microfibers, that's a huge problem. Um, we're using plastic from fossil fuel sources, we're contributing to CO2 emissions. So again, excuse me, that's something that, that we can all do, you know, check out your clothing labels, use natural materials, um, choose natural materials if possible, swap your clothes, etc. Um, and of course, number 10, go out and see seagrass. So, you know, when you're visiting the coast, you know, you're doing doing walking, swimming, kayaking, you might be on your paddle board, you might be fishing, look out for seagrass. Uh, and if you can sort of help other people avoid trampling it or anchoring it or digging in the seagrass um, or other important habitats like salt marshes and mill, um, that would be really, really helpful. You know, we, we need everybody to be aware of seagrass as much as possible. So what else can you do? Um, Networking is really, really important to raise awareness about seagrass. Um, we're speaking to everybody, but in particular to people with boats, um, because they're obviously key for protecting seagrass meadows. Um, but we might also need to connect with all sorts of people that do possibly don't even know they're having an impact on seagrass or an impact on the MPA. So if any of, of you that are joining this evening, you've got connections to any relevant people and that can affect seagrass, then you can use our downloadable remedies project materials. So got lots of information on our Save Our Seabed website. And um, we have leaflets and posters to explain um, all about what you can do to help uh, and things that you can do to, to help sort of sensitive habitats. You can refer uh, people to us directly. Um, you know, we can do another talk um, a little bit like this uh, for people to sort of explain a bit more about what's going on. We can answer some questions directly. Um, and again, if you have a sailor or a motorboat, it'd be absolutely great to hear from you. You know, we'd really like to, to hear your thoughts and hear your views as well. So again, just a little bit more information um, about other sources of info. So we've got the MCS website, Marine Conservation Society website, lots of seagrass articles and blogs on there. Just search for seagrass on mcsuk.org. Um, the RYA, so the Royal Yachting Association, the Green Blue, have got some very useful guides, which I've mentioned already, to, to sort of mooring, to anchoring, coastal boating, inland boating, if you're a boater. We've got the Ocean Conservation Trust, and they post regular blogs and news about the restoration work. Um, you can also visit Plymouth Aquarium as well to see the seagrass cultivation um, in action. Uh, and they've got a fantastic Twitter uh, page as well, so a fantastic Twitter channel that you can have a look about, look at the videos that they that they post as well. So say it's saveourseabed.co.uk. That is the main web page that we're kind of trying to direct traffic to, um, and put a lot of information on as well. So it's just one place you can go um, to see what's happening. Um, please sign up to the project newsletter. There's some great information going into that. All the partners are feeding into that. Um, so please do sign up to that as well. And if you're in the southeast, obviously, please do get involved uh, and contact me again. I've got my colleague Jules in the southwest um, who will be back after Christmas. So, again, you can contact her if you're interested in helping out as well. So that would be really super for us. Again, obviously, we're, I would hope on, on this particular talk that we've got a few people that do some diving or some snorkeling on here. Um, and if you do dive or snorkel in the UK, please do consider helping um, our sea search project. You might know about it already, but if not, um, we've got our sea search volunteers who map the seabed habitats around the whole of Britain. 
uh, Britain and Ireland, sorry, uh, which is absolutely crucial. They they get the data for us. They they tell us what's happening under the water. Um, and Sea Search run training events listed on their web page. So go on to seasearch.org um, or you can email them at on info at seasearch.org.uk as well. Um, and they've got a great Facebook page too. So we've mentioned, I've mentioned a few times that collecting data is, is absolutely crucial. We need, to, we need to have the good science behind us in doing what we're doing. Um, this is just one map um, showing where seagrass is present. So we've got the NBN gateway, the National Biodiversity Network gateway, uh, and they host lots of species maps, lots of records of seagrass uh, on this um, uh, database. And that's inside and outside of MPAs as well. So here we've got a map for, for Zostra Mariner. There are about nine, just over 9,000 records of it here. Um, there's also a seagrass spotter app linked to Project Seagrass. You can download that from Google Play or the App Stores. Um, so you can input data into there. But again, it, it's all these places, they're not a complete map um, because people are putting this information into lots of different areas, which, again, I mentioned previously, we're trying to remedy this. So there's not one database which collects records for seagrass. Um, but if you enter it through Sea Search, we absolutely know it's going to the project. So this will help um, raise awareness enormously. If you can follow our social media pages, again, that's super useful um, in getting the information out there to raise awareness. Um, they can come from a variety of sources and project partners. So these are the, the social media accounts to follow for MCS and the Remedies Project. Uh, we have obviously the, the OCT, so the Ocean Conservation Trust, the Royal Yachting Association in Natural England on there as well. Um, you can use a hashtag, so hashtag Save Our Seabed or hashtag Save Our Seagrass. Again, gets that information out there into the wider, wider public eye. Um, there is actually, if you're really keen, uh, there's a petition you can sign to get seagrass um, to have an official world day as well. So there is a, an unofficial world seagrass day, um, but we'd love to make it official. So if you just search world seagrass day, you can actually go, go and sign a petition to say, yes, we want to make it official and, and, and make it a day. Um, but so, yeah, bringing the world to, together to celebrate seagrass definitely can, can only be a good thing in my book. We've mentioned about getting in touch with kids and talking to children about seagrass and why it's so important. Um, we've got to teach kids the value of these, of these habitats for sure, because if they don't know about them, they won't care about them. Um, they're going to have to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss as they grow up as well. We're already doing it now, but it's going to continue in the future. Um, but we run these fantastic sessions, um, free sessions for primary age school children. Um, also for youth groups as well, um, we'll talk about seagrass, merlin, seaweed as blue carbon superheroes. So we've got the ocean superheroes uh, session. So if you know of a teacher or parents or a group that would like to join a live session, as I say, we do this online or we can do it face to face, depending on what's happening COVID wise. Um, you can email education at mcsuk.org um, and we can go into schools and, and deliver these. Hopefully, there'll be a few of you out there who um, have some photos of seagrass or some film footage or some video clips. Please share that with us if you're willing, um, because we would love to use these clips or these images with your permission um, and show other people how amazing seagrass is and how amazing it isn't to be underwater. So we've got a particular photo here. This was taken by one of our MCS volunteers, Georgie, Georgie Bull. And she actually won the, the British and Irish Underwater Photography Championship in 2020 with this photo. So um, absolutely, it just shows how amazing seagrass is. I just look at that and it just looks absolutely amazing. So Georgie's donated her photos for us to use. And we really do need some, some great images um, to engage with people about what we're doing and um, to get the message out there so that people do care. Um, and they're inspired to help the ocean, too. So it really does make a big difference. A picture tells a thousand words, as they say. Um, we're sort of coming towards the end of, of the, the presentation now, but again, it, it, you know, it would be it'd be really bad of me if I didn't ask you if you would like to help out MCS in some way. Um, you can donate to MCS if you want to. Um, obviously, your contribution will be amazing. We'll greatly support our work. We'll really appreciate it and it will help to protect other MPAs as well. Um, you can also join our volunteer scheme. So again, I keep mentioning the Marine Conservation Society Sea Champions Initiative. Um, and that's where we go out and we do events. You can help with talks like this. 
you could even become an education trained sea champion for example as well so lots of information on our website and um, you can either type in join us or volunteer for us and it will take you to our sea champions uh, volunteering page so i would just like to acknowledge um, some lovely, lovely people who've helped contribute towards this, this talk and this presentation for their images and their information as well. So, um, again, just a few thank yous uh, and acknowledgements to people that have kindly contributed to this. Um, and obviously a massive, massive thank you to everybody out there who's been listening as well. So thank you so much for, for getting to know a little bit more about our Re Life Remedies project. Um, as I say, the information um, that you can that you can go to is saveourseabed.co.uk for lots of lots of details about the project um, and hopefully I can take some questions now as well.